welcome. Would you like Thank to introduce you. your name, course, and your year? Mm -hmm. So uh, my name is Shankari and I am a economics and finance graduate from the University of Surrey. Could you tell us of where your hometown is? Yep, so I live in northwest London and it's been my home since birth actually, yeah. <laughs> Could you tell us what you like what you did on the side while at university? Um, so while at university I was teaching piano, so I'm actually a piano teacher of seven years coming up to eight years now and uh, that's kind of been like my weekend job throughout university. Yeah. Could you remind us of the course you're taking? Yeah, economics and finance. Why did you choose your course? So I chose economics and finance because I've actually been studying economics since GCSE level. So I did economics at GCSE and A level and I think something about the subject really drew me to it so uh, that's kind of why I wanted to pursue that as a degree the fact that it applies to kind of everyday life you can see it in everything and anything you do there's economics there and it's a huge factor and so I wanted to pursue that and understand it more um, at degree level I actually started out with straight economics in my first year but I switched to economics and finance because I wanted to understand from another's perspective the finance side of it and how that feeds into economics and they kind of both go hand in hand. Uh, so that's kind of why I ended up going down the route of economics and finance. What year are you currently in? Um, so I just graduated like a couple of days ago so I'm um, I guess the final year graduate, you could say. And so you finished university the whole three or four years? So it's four years. So I did a placement year in between my second and third year of my degree. So for the last four years, what have you thought of your course? Um, I think my course has been great. Like I've uh, got so much out of it and really learned so many different things that I wouldn't have thought I'd have the chance to, um, especially my final year, I think, although... COVID obviously affected it in terms of the course content and the different aspects that I learned. Uh, they were so interesting and I wouldn't have thought that I'd have the chance to learn about economics in those types of perspectives. Um, and I think it's generally been a very varied course. Like, of course, it's you specialise as the years go on, um, but you still have uh, I've gained so much knowledge in different areas, which I can hope to apply in the future in my future career. Did you come from a sixth form or college background? Um, I came from a sixth form background, so I went to Palmerton School in Watford, um, and yeah, and that's where I did my A levels. Yeah. And what A levels did you do? So I did uh, maths, economics, and politics A level, and I also did further maths AS level, which was available at the time. Did any of those subjects help you with your course at university? A hundred percent. I think all of those subjects really helped me at university, uh, especially economics and maths are the key ones. Um, at my university, it's not required for you to do maths or economics A level because in your first year, everyone's kind of brought up to the same level. But having that prior knowledge and having those prior skills really helped me to kind of keep ahead of the game and really understand things from different perspectives as well you know uh, whether it's different mathematical methods to figure out a problem knowing my a level using my a level knowledge and then using the university method to see which one is more efficient and something that i could understand um, and economics a level helped a lot as well because it helped with uh, learning the basics of economics so they obviously taught that but then went a step above but having that prior knowledge kind of helped me throughout my all three years as well it wasn't just first year it came into play in second year and even final year too for me um, and politics helped to uh, especially in my final year because I did a module called Pol political economy and so knowing the politics background and how that affects um, economics I was able to kind of bring that into the module or at least use that when I was kind of learning from the lecturer and seeing how that could apply. What do you think the best A-levels are, or slash subjects are for your course? Um, I think the best and most key A-levels to take would be maths and economics. Uh, those will really set you up for like all three or four years of your course. Um, and they will help you throughout. Even things like if for maths A-level, you learn things like integrating and differentiating. That comes into play throughout all three years of economics, at least in my experience. Um, I was having to differentiate in my final year modules as well. So it was good, really helpful to have a maths A-level for that, um, having had a lot of practice of that beforehand. Yeah. Could you tell us about your placement year? 
Yep. So um, in between my second and third year, I did a placement at the Walt Disney Company. So I was a finance intern for Disney Channel's Emerging Markets. And essentially what I did was um, I worked with marketing teams in five different territories. So these were Sub-Saharan Africa, Turkey, Israel, Greece, and Middle East, North Africa. And I worked with marketing teams to help forecast, budget, and plan their costs for the financial or fiscal year. And uh, this would kind of include when it comes to like quarter forecast, making sure that uh, they've forecasted their budget spend for that rest of the fiscal year correctly. And then when it came to quarter close, making sure they've actually spent their money, making sure they haven't spent too much or underspent. And, you know, they're basically bang on target. Um, I did a lot of other things as well on placement. I had a lot of other different projects uh, that I was able to get involved with. And uh, it was generally a great placement year. I was lucky enough that it was paid. Um, this kind of varies depending on industry for anyone who's interested in doing placement year but normally if you go into kind of finance banking that type of thing it's kind of guaranteed that it's going to be a paid placement uh, whereas I know some of my friends who did psychology psychology placements or um, if they work for the NHS regardless of kind of degree and may be voluntary or you know they may pay for any of like your accommodation or expenses or something like that it kind of varies industry to industry um, in terms of the rest of my placement year, I also got involved with projects like uh, reports and drawing up reports and doing a lot of data analysis and um, uh, what else? I had a lot of perks as well, uh, luckily enough, working for Disney. So there was actually a cinema in the Hammersmith office and any films that Disney released and remembering that Disney owns Pixar, Marvel, Star Wars, and as well as the Disney franchise, um, any movies that were released through that uh, they would air in the the office cinema so uh, obviously I had to ask my manager but um, I'd basically get paid to, to watch movies which was fun um, and we had like Disney store discount as well um, and freebies and a lot of other things and I think another important project from my placement year was um, so Disney does something called volunteers but ears being Mickey Mouse ears um, and we got to kind of contribute to the community which was really great so I basically took the initiative to organize and plan that for our emerging markets like wider emerging markets team and the Central East and European team so there was a total of 20 of us and we went to volunteer at a disabled children's playground and we basically helped out there the whole day we uh, basically kind of cleared up the area because it was quite run down and it was really nice to give back to the community and um, kind of see uh, our contribution. So, yeah. Could you remind us what university you went to? Yeah, so I went to University of Surrey. So if we talk about the University of Surrey, the best and worst things about studying there, what well, starting off with the worst? Um, the worst, I would say, I mean, in my experience in the past four years, I haven't had many bad experiences. I've been, I think I've been quite lucky. Obviously, this just depends on the student, what they make out, take out of their experience and make out their kind of degree and stuff. Um, I mean, the worst thing, I, I'm, I, the only thing I could say is that some of the accommodation is maybe a little bit old or run down. But even then, uh, we have like, there's cleaners who come at least a couple times a week to keep it well maintained so it's not too bad and even if anything is broken you just call up uh, like facilities and they'll come and fix it um within a couple like within two days or something so it's not been i haven't had any really bad experiences luckily the best things best things is definitely the people there's so many people uh, so many people from different cultures and different backgrounds who come to Surrey. Uh, there's a lot of international students from all over the world. And I think it's just generally that whole kind of campus feel because it's a campus university. So it's like a little university bubble and a lot, you find yourself running into people who kind of know friends of friends and things like that is quite nice. Um, like if you told me before I joined university, I had friends, I would have friends who are, you know, who live in Dubai or Malaysia, things like that. I wouldn't have believed you. But I think it's the fact that it's such an international university. That's probably one of the best things because you get to make friends, amazing friends who come from all around the world. And you also get to learn their ideas and perspectives and kind of, you know, um, learn from each other, I guess. So, yeah. Where did you live in your first year while studying at um, Surrey University? 
So I lived in accommodation on campus. Uh, we have our main campus, which is Stag Hill campus, and I lived in Stag Hill Court. Uh, that accommodation, although it was one of the older accommodations, I think it was probably one of the kind of best ones. It, it, it's uh, kind of your standard accommodation on the bottom floor and uh, kind of two, a bathroom is shared between two people. So it's kind of like having half an ensuite, but you're not playing a really high price for an ensuite. And, uh, and then the top floor had kind of shared rooms, which were really, really cheap uh, because there'd be like an upstairs and a downstairs to the room. And then four, four people would share a bathroom, but, uh, and then 10 of us would share a kitchen. And then generally that accommodation was great because we had cleaners come two to three times a week to clean our bathrooms, our kitchens and take out the bins. So anything that was shared facilities, we didn't really need to deal with. And um, so that was kind of, I guess, a bonus. Whereas I know with other universities, it, it varies from university to university. So, um, yeah. And in your opinion, what kind of vibe is that university accommodation? Is that like the party house? Is that the calm house? Is that the revising house? If you were going to that accommodation, what should you expect? I think Stag Hill Court is kind of, I guess it's the party one because it's quite close to the on-campus nightclub. But then again, uh, it kind of depends because Stag Hill Court is quite big. If you're kind of further up the hill, it's a little bit quieter. But where my house was, it was kind of en route to town. And also right, you could hear Rubik's, which is a, a student nightclub. You could hear it from your room sometimes as well. Uh, so it's a, it's a bit of both, but leaning towards party, I think. And your second year? Uh, in my second year, I lived in a house with my friends off campus, and that was private. Uh, that was private renting. And what's the transition from going from a accommodation? Oh, from going for a student accommodation on campus to a private accommodation. Um, I think it's quite big. There's huge changes. I mean, the first thing is you're not sharing bathroom and a kitchen with a lot of people, uh, whether it's 10 or, you know, some cases, 14 people. I think that's the biggest thing. And the second thing is also the whole idea of paying rent and bills. So when you're in student accommodation, it's often the fact that all of the costs of, you know, rent, Wi-Fi bills, you know, cleaning bills, whatever it is, it's all kind of mushed into one package. So you just pay one lump sum and you don't see how that's divided. Whereas when you go into housing in second year, you see all those costs individually and often it's a bit higher as well because with university accommodation, I guess they probably, there's ways to economically manage it so it's cheaper. Uh, whereas with kind of private housing and private renting, it can be a bit more expensive. Um, so I think that was a big change, you know, working out bills and stuff. So my housing was uh, without bills. So we had to go out of our, like we had to research, you know, getting Wi-Fi installed and um, picking the right kind of ga gas supplier, I guess, and things like that. So we weren't paying too much. Um, and also the fact that uh, things like cleaning and stuff, because in our accommodation, it was all done. We had to obviously take on those responsibilities and split it equally between us and things like taking out the bins. I think that those kind of things were probably the big change from accommodation to uh, student housing. And just to go back, you mentioned 14 people is the biggest uh, room you would get, like kind of flat you would get, but you said shared toilet. So does that imply all 14 people shared a set amount of toilets or do they have their own, their own toilet? Um, so that was, that's a different court. I think there's like two different courts which have kind of, they have 14 different rooms and those rooms have a sink in them. So they have their own sink, but then there would be kind of three or four separate toilets and three or four separate showers. And from my friends who lived in those courts, they've said that they've never had to wait for a toilet or a shower and it's always been cleaned and, you know, they haven't had any big issues. Um, and then the kitchens are huge for those, uh, for those courts as well, because obviously there's 14 people. Um, so it's, it's a massive space for them to share. And your third year? And my third year. So um, after placement year, um, I came back to University of Surrey. So and, I meant your um, placement year, sorry. So where no, you made my placement year. Okay. Where did you stay uh, in your placement year? <laughs> Uh, placement year I came back home for a year so I just commuted because the office was in Hammersmith in London um, I just commuted every day so I managed to save myself quite a lot of money which is good and then your final year and my final year um, so my final year I went back to university accommodation so at Surrey it's not guaranteed but sometimes they're able to provide accommodation for students who come back from placement I think it's 
mainly guaranteed for students who come back ab from placements abroad uh, because obviously it's difficult to find housing if you're living in another country for the next year but um, I was still lucky enough to uh, get university accommodation this time I was in university court which has um, ensuite rooms so I had my own bathroom and then I shared a kitchen with uh, 13 other people in that house um, and so again the kitchen was cleaned like twice a week and bins were taken out uh, but in terms of like your own room and your own bathroom you had to keep that clean yourself because it was kind of your own facilities I guess. Is there a reason you chose not to go back to private accommodation over student yeah. accommodation? Yeah I think it's because with private accommodation it's much more I feel like there's a lot of terms and conditions and you know there's thing there's kind of a lot of small print when you're signing contracts and things and if it, bills aren't included that can be tricky business too it gets quite messy and I think with student accommodation it's much more you know it's a much more cleaner system I found it to be as well and it's not I haven't had any problems with student accommodation either um like if I did have any like electricity has gone out or whatever um I knew who to call. I just had to call facilities and then they'll come and fix it. And if it was something urgent, they'll come and fix it within the same day. And, um, and also being on campus as well, everything's within walking distance and I feel safe. Like if I wanted to go study late at night and just walk to the library and walk back and I'd be completely safe. Whereas I feel like if I lived off campus, then I wouldn't be able to go to the library late. And then what I, I wouldn't feel secure enough. I feel like, uh, but that's just like me as a person. Some people still do that anyway, but yeah. <laughs> If we go into the Surrey area, could you tell us about the yeah. nightlife? Yep. So, I mean, there's kind of two areas of nightlife. I mean, the first area of nightlife would be on campus and there's like an on-campus nightclub uh, or the main one, which is Rubik's. And then there's another one called The Basement. And then in terms of Surrey kind of area, so the town that the University of Surrey is in is Guildford Town. And there you've got lots of pubs and nightclubs kind of suited to different flavours. So I guess the three main nightclubs would be kind of Casino, uh, Bar 13 and Pop World. What's uh, Pop the World's nightclub kind of, for you? For me? For you? For me, uh, Bar 13 is kind of my, my vibe. And what attracts you um, about Bar 13? I think it's the the music genres because it's quite they have two levels on a normal night and on both levels they play different types of music so like on the bottom level kind of be your mainstream music whereas the top level might be more grime r&b kind of that thing but um also sometimes university societies hire out the club to do their own events and again it's a similar situation depending on the society and what type of music they want to play um but generally that's why that's i guess hey. So if we go into the area too, so what are the shops and food variety like? Is there a lot of shops, compared to where you live now, is there a lot of shops like your mainstream shops and your local shops or is it just mainstream or is it just local? Well, what's it like uh, trying to get some food and trying to shop in the area? Um, I think there's quite a lot of variety. I mean, you've got the, a huge Tesco store, probably like 10 to 15 minute walk away from Stag Hill campus, depending whereabouts on campus you live and how fast you walk. And then in terms of Guildford Town, there's a lot of shops there too. I mean, you've got Sainsbury's as well. And uh, all pretty much all your mainstream shops you can think of are in like the Friary Centre or on the High Street or the different banks as well, regardless of, you know, whoever you have a bank account with, they probably have a bank in town, which is good. Um, they also have high-end shops, obviously, as a student, it's unlikely, you, you, I mean, it depends, obviously, um, but if you have a high-end taste, there's also high-end shops there, too, um, but I've managed to, like, anything I shop for, there's normally been a shop there, and it's not too bad, but I think, in comparison to London, obviously, I can take the tube and go to Westfield, obviously, in comparison to that, it's not much, because London, London has everything, but um, Guildford is still, it's still got quite a good number of shops, I think. Um, to do your shopping. So, yeah. Is there anything else you think students should know about the Surrey area or the Guildford, I should say, area? Um, I think generally Guildford is, a, I really enjoyed it and I really liked it as an area because I've lived in London my whole life. So I'm used to the city life, whereas Guildford is kind of that perfect middle. It's not kind of the middle of nowhere and the countryside. 
it's it's like a little town it's quite quaint and it's got all the shops that you still need and restaurants as well um so it still has that feel to it so it's like that perfect middle and like there are nice green areas in Guildford too I think there's a place called the mount which I still didn't get the chance to go to I wanted to uh, before I graduated but hopefully I'll go back after covid um but there's nice green areas around guildford as well so i think it's that per- the fact that it's a perfect middle um like city plus countryside together um is great and then you can also you're it's only a half an hour train ride away from london central london too uh so if you do want the city life life it's not too far away at all okay so what advice would you give to students about to start their or what general advice would you give to students about to start their first year of university Um, I think the main thing, I think there's a few tips. I think the first thing is kind of go in with no expectations. So when I went to Saru, I had no idea what to expect. You know, I just was like, I'll be myself. What happens will happen, you know. And I think that's the best kind of mindset to go into. So that if you have really high expectations and then, you know, the whichever university you go to it doesn't meet that then at least then in that case you might get disappointed but if you go in with no expectations no no whether it's low or high uh there's no way you can be disappointed you'll just experience everything as it comes and the fir- the second thing would be to put yourself out there just meet all whoever it is i mean it sounds cliched but you are all in the same boat when you join university uh it's quite likely you're your school friends aren't going to go to the same university. And even if they do, universities are massive. So the likelihood of, you know, bumping into them or, you know, uh, you know, whether you do the same course and things like that or have the same friends, it's quite small. So just put yourself out there, just meet loads of people. Just, you know, I remember in my first like week or so, first two weeks, I'd literally walk up to someone or like someone was sat next to me in a lecture who I didn't know. I'd just, you know, say, hi, I'm Shank. Karine, nice to meet you and you know that's how you find friends and stuff and definitely join societies I think that's a big uh, a huge thing to do I mean it can be quite daunting because obviously it's going to be all the elder years you're not going to know anyone but at the same time a lot of first years are also going to be joining those same uh, societies too and that's also how you make friends and stuff I made a lot of friends through going to kind of different societies and their events and socials so yeah I guess those are the main tips like be yourself um go just take the initiative to like speak to loads of different people um and like start university with like no expectations just go in so you can experience everything as it comes what advice would you give to students about the study at surrey university um i think the main thing is uh you like use all the resources that are available there's so many different resources that Surrey provides and um kind of uh making use of those and definitely joining lots of societies i mean in your first week you, we have something called freshers fair so all the different societies clubs sports teams etc they all have a stand there and you can kind of go and chat to them uh, get a vibe of if that's right for you and you're not tied to joining the society you can just put your name down and kind of Uh, like within the first few weeks of university these societies clubs or sports teams they will have kind of a meet and greet and that's uh, that's literally just for you to go to that event to see if the society is right for you if it's the kind of right vibe and atmosphere Um, so there's no harm in uh, kind of going to these societies and just seeing if it's the right fit for you and if it's something you'd like to do and even if there's a sport that you've never tried ever definitely do it I wish like I had the courage to do that in my first year like I would have liked to try a different sport and also if it fit in if it had fitted in with my schedule and stuff Um, and I think one other thing I'd say as well is for Surrey specifically we uh, the, the university offers something called a GGA which is a global graduate award what you can do with that is uh, learn a language uh, for free and it shows up in your transcript as well saying that you've learned a language whichever kind of uh, level you learn whether it's kind of beginners or you know being able to speak it proficiently um, if I'd known that in my first year I definitely would have done it because learning another language is so useful especially when you go into the working world and generally how um, kind of interlinked the world is right now too so definitely do a GGA if languages, even if languages aren't too much of your thing, you can always do just the basic level. And at least you, you know the basics of another language and it's great for career prospects. So, yeah. 
lastly, what advice would you give to students about the study of course? Um, I think for my course, I'd say be uh, the first month, the first semester is okay. I mean, be prepared. I mean, I can only speak from a background of having previously studied maths and economics, but I know for people who didn't study maths or economics, they, they may, some of them may have struggled a little bit with the math side, but since then, and um, I remember during our time, and I think it's kind of evolved over the years, there's a maths and statistics hub. So don't feel afraid to reach out for help. I think that's the main thing. Start When you're starting a new course, uh, not everyone's done economics before. Don't feel afraid to ask questions. And j j there's no such thing as a stupid question. Like really, like if, if you're too afraid to put your hand up in a lecture, that's totally fine. Cause I often didn't put my hand up in a lecture, but don't be afraid to email the lecturer. I would email the lecturer if I had a question. Um, that's totally fine. They're meant to ask, answer your questions anyway. Um, and especially in tutorials as well. If you have kind of the smaller kind of classroom size workshops or t tutorials or seminars, whatever you want to call them ask questions there because I think it's a bit easier to ask a question and have a discussion in that environment because it's less people um, and I think the final thing I'd say especially for my course is always good to speak to as many different people that you can and try to gauge uh, you know what they're like it's always good to have different connections so like when you come to revising for modules and stuff you can have study groups uh, that's really really helped me I think a lot in, in my final year. Whereas in first year, I didn't really do that as much. I did it a little bit, but I think it's kind of evolved over the years. Uh, basically going out of your way to form study groups really helps you when it comes to exams because everyone has a different perspective and you know different uh, levels of knowledge. So when you bring that all together, it can really, really help. So, yeah. You chose going to university over an apprenticeship just going right into work. What path mm -hmm. do you make this choice? Um, so I think for me, because I knew that I wanted to pursue economics um, as in some way or form as a degree, I think, or it, as a career, sorry, I knew that a degree was the way to go. So when I was doing my research, um, I used a website called Prospects and that kind of gave me, I looked at loads of different jobs on that and that kind of gave me an idea of what I wanted to do in the future. That's changed since, but um, it's still all the kind of jobs that I wanted to do in that industry they all said that you needed a degree um, and they did say of either economics or like maths or that kind of background is needed so that's why I chose a degree over apprenticeship I mean looking back I probably uh, could have gone the apprenticeship route but uh, for me I wanted that university life that university experience and having that degree and like I'm glad I made that choice for me I think it it fit my abilities and my skills for me to go that route instead of the apprenticeship route. Can you tell us more about you doing piano during university and what your plans are now for it? Yep, yeah, so um, I would, uh, every weekend when I was at university, I would travel back home because I would come back home to give my piano lessons. And um, another thing I did alongside the piano is uh, I have a YouTube channel called Passion for Piano. Uh, that's kind of like a little hobby project uh, where I post covers of songs or medleys and uh, sometimes composed music. Uh, in my first and second year of university, I had a bit more time to... Uh, post the odd video um, but as near the end of second year and placement year and final year uh, things obviously got serious I had to focus more on my studies and kind of graduate job applications so I wasn't able to do that but uh, now that I have the time to I've kind of rebooted that up and I'm kind of getting back into posting covers and medleys and things like that um, and I'm also going to be hopefully trying to find some more piano students too because I love to share my passion with the younger generation and hopefully inspire them so, so yeah. where where can students uh so your youtube they can find you is there anywhere specifically you'd like them to contact you and what area do you cover um so my youtube channel name is passion for piano uh, one word and then if they want to contact me I guess you could I'll I'll put like an uh, uh, an email in my about section of my YouTube channel so you can probably contact me on that probably um, in the description too 
yeah or leave it in the description I'll give uh, an email um, and in terms of piano lessons uh, normally I have students come to me but obviously with coronavirus it's all been virtual uh, so if uh, if you're interested in learning piano I can give you virtual lessons that's not a problem so with the area like you said they come to you where, you, where can you manage where you're based uh, northwest London so I'm basically zone five of London if that makes sense okay. so at this point we let students have what I like to call free-for-all you could say what you like you could tell a story you could give advice you could say thank you you could you could just chat rubbish for the next five minutes <laughs> or two minutes literally the floor is yours um okay i guess well another thing i'll mention is i think my biggest advice to anyone uh researching university thinking about going to university <clears throat> if you're in your first year is 100 percent do a placement uh regard like if your university provides it or you know has that placement service 100 percent do it um if if your university doesn't do it that's absolutely fine you can just take a gap year between your second year and third year and do a placement then if doing a whole year of work isn't for you, at least the minimum I'd say is do a summer internship. So as well as my placement at Disney, I also did a summer internship at HM Treasury. Having had both of those experiences, those are both great, but I think when you have a placement year, you have a full 12 months to really make a difference at a company. It's not just a short-term project that, you know, it's finished within a few months. You're, you're kind of a cog in the whole company you're helping it to keep going in a placement whereas when I was in my summer internship at HM Treasury it was a great experience and I, I can tell that I made a difference to the department but some of the projects were quite long term so I was only able to kind of kick start the projects in my summer which then had to be carried on um, by kind of the rest of the team or whoever else was going to carry on the project so with the placement, you get to see things through. Whereas with a summer internship, it's obviously dependent on the projects that are given and stuff, but it's a bit more difficult, I think. Um, but the main thing is like experience is what you need. Uh, and in my placement kind of job application experience, I went through so many kind of rejections. I went to a lot of interviews, video interviews. You do so many online tests as well. Because I had that experience, it helped me for my graduate job like applying for that so I wasn't phased by it because I knew what to expect having had that like that cut for experience for placement jobs which is already competitive and obviously times that by 10 or however much you want for the actual job market having already experienced that it wasn't too scary this time around I think um, and yeah and with placement and summer internship as well I was able to draw upon that when I got to in, lucky enough to get to the job interview stage I had a lot to talk about like I was able to talk about those experiences and the skills I learned even if like the graduate job I was applying to was completely different to my previous experiences there's so many transferable skills that you can pass on and you can talk about in your interview um, because at least you're proving yourself that you have done things you're not just saying I am a leader and you don't have proof of that you have proof of a project you've done or whatever it is so yeah I think the main thing is definitely do a placement minimum summer internship because it will help you out a lot and normally I, I've had a lot of great experiences not just mine but a lot of my friends as well so yeah don't forget to like subscribe and I am plugged in thank you no problem yeah.